شلون؟ شلون؟ ثانك يو مش Well, first of all, uh, I will repeat it, but it's, it's important to repeat it. Thanks to the organizers for the opportunity to speak in here. And uh, so, uh, let's see. So, okay, the title is not necessary, but let's say the main motivation, so what I will, I will talk about, it's gonna be related to a paper that I, I posted earlier this month in the archive, in HEPTH, but I think it's actually very related to series of works that, that I've been doing with collaborators since 2018 until today. And some of these collaborators are uh, Mateo Becaria, Marina David, Davide Casani, Alfredo Gonzalez Lescano, uh, Dario Martelli, uh, and Samir Murti. Okay. And the main motivations, the motivation that we had with these works was, well, overarching, perhaps it was not the initial motivation, the first of the works, looking at everything now at distance is really to understand ADS-CFT duality, what is called ADS-CFT duality. And it's more concrete a representation, which is called ADS-5-CFT for the simplest example in this category. I will okay, try to summarize what is it in a while. And there is, of course, physics into it. Uh, I will sacrifice some of that physics explanation of some of that physics in, into this talk, because I will try to make links with uh, things that I think could be interesting for, for mathematicians, okay? So uh, the physics will be a little bit underlined, okay? Uh, and so what is the program? What is it ADS-CFT? Okay, if I have to summarize it, uh, the idea is you have some gravitational theory on, on ADS-5 and the theta 5 which is space that, that has a conformal symmetry, it's, it's, sorry, a conformal, it has a boundary, let's say. And then it's, it's the, the theory that I want to quantize is a theory of gravity in there is. Uh, the simplest example is what people call type 2b, uh, string theory in ADS5, transcends 5, okay? I will not introduce this completely. But broadly speaking, let's say one focuses on, on simple observable, which could be the partition function, the Euclidean partition function, meaning by this, I will denote it like this, so, that is a set G, is a path integral. This is one of the possible observables that one can define. It's a path integral, let me denote the measure like this, over, let's say, metric fields, some fermionic fields, and other fields in the theory, with some uh, weight, which, is, which has an overall factor. You can think of it as the inverse, eh, eh, the inverse of, the, of the Newton constant of this of a underlying classical theory of gravity, where G is the metric. And then there is some Euclidean action, which is again a functional, or a fun local functional, or it may not be, let's say, functional of the metric, the fermionic fields, and the other fields in the, in the theory. And uh, broadly speaking, one could imagine that to get this Euclidean, usually what we do in physics is you start from some Lorentzian, you, you have a classical theory of gravity, let's say. You start from some Lorentzian theory, and then to go to this obs the observable that I will focus on today, you do a weak rotation. So you take the Lorentzian time, and you change it by an imaginary time. Okay. And then, it, in, in the best of the cases, hypothetically, you would be able, I mean, you, you would need to solve this path integral over metrics which are asymptotically ADS, ADS5 times S5, say. A, and, uh, and then, but of course, there are many, I mean, you need to solve some over many histories, many different classical background configurations. We will be interested today Again, this is very abstract, but I will make it concrete using ADS-CFT in a while. We would be interested in, on doing this path integral, okay, over fields that obey certain boundary conditions, as for instance, very abstractly, could be something like this. I will define what this means. Let me write it, and then I will define. Just a minute.
let me just, okay, this is for the I mean, right to the infinite privilege. So you impose some certain boundary conditions. So let me say we have our fields. The metric is going to be asymptotically ADS5 times S5. The boundary of this space, I will assume it will be of this form, R times S3 times S5, where R is essentially the time, the Euclidean time. Okay? And then if I try to quantize a classical theory of gravity, for instance, if I try to define a Hamiltonian in, in the geometry, that would be essentially zero if I don't have boundary. But if I have boundary, the Hamiltonian gets, by using the normal procedure, I can define it at the boundary of ADS5. And essentially, what ads -EFT says is that, and I, okay, and in that boundary, I can define other charges, let's say, no? So I can define, for instance, S3, the isometries group is SO4. S5, the isometry group is SO6. And then I can have, this is the same as SU2 times, SU2 times SU2. So I can have a generator of left rotations and a generator of right rotations. But this is now in the boundary of ADS5, okay? Localized in the boundary. And then I can have, again, I have three generators for SO6. But I will take, for simplicity, for pedagogy, for just for to write the less, we'll take one of them simply, and I will denote as, as R, okay? And then at the classical level, I should be able to use another procedure to define these guys. So charges, oper functional associated to J1, J2, and R, acting on each one of the classical fields. And I can then, if I want to quantize my theory, I can then associate charges to each one of these fields with respect to this charge operate charge uh, functionals or operators. And then I can, I can say, okay, this is too broad as an integral. I can say, okay, I, I want to restrict the integration, again, a two week rotation, to fields obeying this boundary condition. This is what I was gonna write before. So I have, remember, Euclidean time, I periodize it with some period beta. And then I sort of twist the periodic boundary conditions by the charges of each one of the fields with respect to J1, J2, and J and R. So P, J1 of the operator G, and then Q, J2 of the operator G, of the, of the field G, and then U, R of the operator G. And I have to define also boundary conditions for the other fields in here perform the integral. So for fermions, the usual procedure is you just say antiperiodic boundary conditions. I have now P to at the charge of the fermion now, Q, uh, J2 of the fermion, and the same U, the R of the fermion. I will not write it down. Okay. And if you have all fields, you have to do the same for them. Now, in this setup, then you can, so as I said, you have another procedure in principle, you define charges at the boundary, and it's something gravitational, a way, gravitational way of doing the, uh, the computation, let's say. But then, this is a sort of, like, this is a Lagrangian formulation of the problem. If I have charges defined at the boundary, I can do now a Hamiltonian formulation of the same problem, okay? And then I can say that set G, and I say that set G localizes to a boundary. But now instead of doing a Lagrangian formulation, I say, okay, I want to quantize my theory using boundary data, okay? So I can, in principle, that implies that you need to construct a Hilbert space at the boundary, okay? So that's why I'm putting this delta here. And the observable that should match to this is now this partition function. Okay. Taking trace over certain Hilbert space construction. We, I will see this, we will see this in, in more detail. 
Okay? So this, this is a Lagrangian construction for this observable, the Euclidean partition function at inverse temperature beta, and with some rapidities dual to a specific charges to J1P, the rapidity dual to J1Q, the rapidity dual to J2, and U, the rapidity dual to R. For conventions, and okay, the rapidities will be related to chemical potentials in this way. to pi alpha, okay? So the unexponentiated one will be, the exponentials will be the rapidities, the unexponentiated will be the, the chemical potentials, okay? And then the, right. Now this is very abstract now, that this is, if we knew ADS-EFT and we had the proof of ADS-EFT, the idea would be to do this path integral, okay? But we don't know how to do this except for very uh, counted examples, okay? But, uh, right, not in ADS-5 CFT4, certainly. But there are at least one example where people claim that they are able to solve something like this. Like, it would be like a topologically twisted version of the gravity that they are able to solve by using localization, okay? But we don't know how to do this in ADS-5 CFT4, not yet, okay? Nevertheless, what ADS CFT says is that now you can do a computation, instead of doing all this, you can then focus on the boundary theory, the Hilbert space that you need to look is, is the one of four dimensional n equal to four, un, Sorry, U N. Uh, right, well, it's called like super jam Mills theory. On R times S three, and I insist on this to draw difference to uh, the talk by uh, Rudolf yesterday. No, the background he used yesterday was a different one. Something. Okay, that would be a different path integral than this one, completely different. The functions will be different, as you will see. So I will focus on this, but this is time direction. And this is the content of ADS-CFT for this observable. Then there are more complicated observables, you need to do something. But for this observable, it would be this path integral with these periodic boundary conditions, twisted periodic boundary conditions, should correspond to this trace computed over the Hilbert space of n equal to four super jump mills, okay? Now, this is hard to, complete, to compute. Why? Because the conformal, so this, so this would be a twisted Hamiltonian, sorry, I, mean, I didn't mention this. So this would be the operator that generates translations in whatever is, is your time. You can twist your time with coordinates, okay? angular coordinates as well, and that would essentially take combinations of deltas with these other generators. But this, Values, the eigenvalues of this operator would depend on the coupling. So they depend on, on lambda. Okay. And if one really wants to make at this level, this is quant this would be a quantum gravity theory. Okay. But if okay. Okay, let, let's keep this on, on hold for a moment. But just keep in mind that this is a difficulty here. So in principle, to compute this observable, you will need the full spectrum of the theory at any value of the coupling. Okay. And this is, at the moment, we can ask <laughs> people here that know much better than me, but I think this is still not like done concretely. Okay. We will bypass in some way, in some specific okay, point in moly space, meaning by moly space, the specific values, combination of chemical potentials is this problem, but we will see. But well, before going into the field theory, let me mention something about gravity. As I, I wrote down here, one of the motivations was essentially also, it's ADS-EFT more, more than black holes, but actually we are using what we know, certain things that we know about black holes in semi-classical theories of gravities to try to sort of bootstrap new things about ADS-EFT, okay? And that's, that's really one of the goals. So let me go back to gravity. So, when you, when we all see a path some, on interval that is complicated, the initial way to try to attack it is to say, okay, let's, let's see if we can do a style approximation to a path interval and simplify it a bit, okay? Now, the parameter that you see at first in here is simply this, which is 
for the purposes of this talk is the inverse of, of the Newton constant, okay? So the semi-class, the naive semi-classical approximation in the times of Hawking and, and Gibbons. So one question is, what is a classical, what is a semi-classical? limit in a to gravity. And the naive answer is just simply take n to be much larger than one. Informally take n to infinity. Okay? Meaning G Newton to zero. Okay. Now in the old days that that's okay. In principle, you would say, naively, you would say, okay, you take n to infinity, then essentially it should be enough to find solutions, classical solutions to whatever is the action that you have in here, evaluate on those solutions, and that gives you an approximation to the integral. But what we have learned in the last few years is that that's actually not enough. I will explain right now why. And it is not enough because this limit is actually very complicated. I will not say ill-defined, but it's very complicated in the sense that you have many solutions, many different solutions to this action, to this Euclidean action. There are not many solutions to a Lorentzian action, but once you go to Euclidean and you impose these twisted boundary conditions, there are many Euclidean solutions that come from the, just from a single Lorentzian solution. Okay? And not all of them are equivalent. They will be different. So in, in order to have to single out one of these possible solutions, I will explain how this comes now, you need to do something else, and that's, and that's, you need essentially to take some limits on, I mean, to, specify, right, to, right, you need to specify it singular boundary conditions. And now, this sounds very broad, but I will, one of the goals is to explain what, what I mean by this. Where by singular, mon well, boundary conditions, I just mean this, what I just said, no? Are essentially choices of P, Q, and, and U, okay? And now, as I said, why, so what is the evidence that we have to claim that N to infinity is not enough and that we need to add something else? For that, we go again to field theory. We'll come back to a field theory approach. And to a problem that I mentioned before, the coupling depends, I mean, sorry, the a, a spectrum depends on the, on the coupling. The eigen values depends on, depend on the coupling. So we, we cannot do a computation that finds a coupling. We don't know how to do it, okay? But we can take specific value, meaning by this. I assume that u goes to one, and then, and now I'm thinking on, a, on n equal to force by Jamil, so all this can be made. By using another procedure, you can define J1, J2, and, and R in terms of uh, bilinears of, of fundamental rising, and lowering operators. So I take U equal to minus one, this specific limit, and then I assume that I choose this symmetry generator in such a way that minus one to a fermionic number in the theory is minus one to that symmetry operator in the theory. This is not always possible, but for n equal to first by Mills, this is possible to do. There is one, I mean, in physics language, there is one R symmetry combination that you can use to twist the physical partition function. And when you do that, and you evaluate the boundary partition function at u equal to minus one, what you end up is, you end up with this, x to delta, ej1, uj2, and then minus one to the F. And now I assume that my twisted Hamiltonian, delta, is the commutator of two, I mean of a certain supercharge in the theory. There are 32 supercharges in the theory. I pick up one of them, and the complex conjugated. And this, by definition, is semi-positive definite, okay? 
So this is a twisted Hamiltonian. In, in the language of quantum, of supersymmetric quantum mechanics, this would be Hamiltonian. And then you just have you know, the, all right. So I assume this. And of course, this is a trace over the full Hilbert space. Or whatever, you know. And this actually turns, turns out to be independence of x is e to a minus beta, independence of beta. So it's, and moreover, you can even reduce the Hilbert space to simple states which are in the cohomology of Qs and do a trace over there is equal to a thing. So this simplifies a lot life. And it is also, so this is on index, it's a with an, with an index, I will call it I. It is independent of the coupling. It doesn't depend on the value of the coupling. So I can go to zero coupling and I can extract, I mean, at working at lambda equal to zero, I can extract information that would, would be Give, I mean, I can extract information about the partition function set G, essentially, in here, okay? And in this, in this, in that series of work and all works, and also work by, by others, it has been understood that in order to select just a single solution, I mean, it's not enough with n to infinity, okay? In order to select, this actually gets many contributions, even if you, even when you take, a, you take n to infinity. You really need to take a large charge limit on that, meaning by that singular boundary conditions. Some of these singular boundary conditions are defined by this. Again, I will show how this comes about again, but let me just state it and then we'll. So it's essentially when P and Q goes to roots of unity. Okay, the J ones you can think of to be a integer numbers, you think of them as integer numbers in some units. And the limits in which P and Q goes to roots of unities are the singular limits in which you select a specific geometries, Euclidean geometries, in this path in there. But the ones that dominate is, is this limit here. So it's a lambda, I will call it lambda to infinity limit. But what I really mean is, is to pick up singular boundary conditions in the work. By well notice, if I put u minus one in here, and this is minus one to the f, that would cancel this in here, and then the partition function is like computing a partition function for periodic fermions then, no? And that's the supersymmetric partition function in that background, okay? Okay, at this level, it's still a bit abstract. It will become more concrete. You will see some functions over here. But the goal is this, focus on roots of unit, unit limits of, of these guys. Again, this is only at you, this is only at this point. I'm just uh, reviewing what we have found in this setup. What we find there is, for instance, that the leading contribution is, it comes when you take this, you take a land n to infinity, but then you take also a limit in which omega one and omega two essentially localize, essentially no, localize around, around zero. Then you can have more refined versions of that in which you have you adopt some rational, I mean, T1 and T2 are essentially a, a rational numbers. You can do that. But this would be subleading, okay? We will see that. The leading contribution comes from, now let me focus on the leading contribution, come from this guy here. This is physically, what, what is capital lambda? I, I will come to that. So it's, but let me say something before that. So physically, and I, we will see why, this corresponds to, to a large charge expansion. Give me a couple of minutes and I will reach it. Okay. All right. Right, the omegas, right. The P's, the P's and the Q's, so they will be the logs, the logs of the P's and the Q's. So the angular velocities, it's just, it's the angular velocity. Good, so perfect. So now, what is what are this? What is this actually? Let me end show. Okay, but right, the, the lesson now before going into more technical stuff, the lesson to remember is the following. So you take n to infinity, and let's go to abstract gravity side. N to infinity is not enough to pick up a, a, a gravitational solution. You need to take also this sort of limits mathematically. Now, what is the physics of this lambda going to infinity? That's what I'm gonna go next. Or let me do it now. Right, it's still in the setup u to the minus one. 
Now, what is this? So, one observable that one looks, at, let's say, okay. So, one of these solutions would be a black hole, actually. Okay. And now, suppose that I'm interested in computing this observable. So, trace, and now we'll come back to n equal to force over Yamis. Now, I want to take the trace over the full Hilbert space, but now I want to look only at states with fixed J1 and, and J2. Okay. And I'm computing now this, in this case, let me define the full observable. And then we localize x delta. The definition of this is a is essentially so you need to do a plus transform. Okay, the, the trace, the full trace, but now multiplied by E omega 1, J1, omega 2, J2. Well, these are now numbers, okay, as I said. Okay. Say that, this, ah, sorry, sorry, this is Q. Yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> so this would be Q, J1 and J2. Yes, sorry. Good. So, now suppose that, that I take, right, suppose now that I want to look, I want to compute this, okay? And suppose that I know this guy, so that I can write it as e to the sum free energy minus some free energy, which is a function of, of all the rapidities here, okay? So beta, so all the, all the angular moment, all the chemical potentials, u and n, Sorry, it's a alpha, I call it. Okay. Now, if, and I, I want to look, in this case, I will choose some, some power. So I want, I want to take, this is gonna be the same lambda. Now, obviously I know the answer. That's why I'm, I'm picking up this, okay. But I choose this. Where the seed of guy doesn't grow when lambda goes to infinity or goes to like order one, okay. And now I plug this in here, and then take lambda to infinity. Right, the complete trace, right, or the full, or. Right, no, no, here are, there are operators, right. Right, 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 right. Perfect, perfect, perfect. In here, this, there are numbers. Right, right, this, there are numbers, right, right, right. Very, very good, very good. So in here, there are, they are operators, and then I'm taking the trace over. Exactly, exactly. And they, on the other side, there are numbers, right, perfect. And now I, I take, I want to estimate this. So what happens when I take lambda to infinity in there? And then you see, if, if this function f in here is regular, let's assume it's regular, what's happened when I take lambda to infinity? Essentially, well, essentially these guys will dominate, and what I will have in here is simply just the integrals of, of Faces. So this would give a delta on J1 and J2. It would give nothing, actually. So the only con non trivial contribution in this scaling limit will come from singularities of this guy, of this function f. Here. So if the function f is regular, game over. You don't get anything. So you need to look only at singularities. That's the thing. When you take lambda large charges expansions, the contribution localizes always to singularities of the free energy. That's the lesson to, to recall, okay? And now, what we will do, what we will try to see, is what are these singularities? We'll try to classify what are these singularities, okay? Uh, of course, ideally, you will need to do that for the strongly coupled, so you start from the, the, for the spectrum of the strongly coupled theory, but we don't know how to do that. So at U, we can do it either for the free theory, okay? That's what I will do. Or you can do it also for a free theory at u equal to minus one in here for the index. And then you, you get something that is protected, okay? And you can compare with supergravity. And that's where, what we have learned in the, in the few years. But we'll try, my goal today is to give step away from, small step away from this point, okay? But we'll see. Okay. Very good. Very good, yes, it doesn't need to be lambda q, perfect. So it can be, I can put some n in here and leave it open. No, 
let's say. And uh, and then I can write. And then I can I can essentially so the idea is, is to comp these two terms will compete. No? So once I understand the degree of divergence of these guys, then I fix that that value of n. Exactly. So that you will see now we have that where it comes from. Good. But this simplifies this simplifies a lot actually. And, and obviously there Okay, we will see. We will we will reach there, because what it, this is saying is that you don't need to. This will be a very, very, relatively cumbersome function, very complicated, relatively complicated function. Okay, what this is telling is that you don't need to look at all the complications. Focus on the singularities, and you will see how it simplifies a lot the analysis. Then you need to reconstruct, and that's where what that where it makes link with the goal of the of the workshop. Okay, how to reconstruct the full okay, sublink corrections. Okay, that, that's the next step. Good. Okay. As I said, okay, it, it, the limits near a singularity may be simple, but then you can have many singularities. It's not as simple, you know. Uh, along, you know, around each singularity is very simple, but then you can have these singularities, but you can have also singularities which are at other roots of unity. Okay. You need to study all all of those singularities. All of those will correspond to different gravitational side points. Good. So now let's see. Let's see what is okay. Again, th this story, in this explanation that I gave, which is very schematic, I was implicitly assuming this guy. So I was implicitly assuming that we go to an index and that this is a okay. There has to be, and this we knew some before, but there has to be some modification for this more general case because you need to. Let me leave it like this. Let us go to see how this function now uh, looks, and then we, I come back to this point. Okay. Okay. Where do I leave like this? It is here. So, how these functions look like? How does this function look like? Well, it's a partition function. It's going to be a complicated Q series, but you will see now. So let me again let me focus on lambda equal to zero. So zero gauge coupling. I will not write down the more general because it's too big. Actually, I won't be able to write down. But it's in the paper actually. But I can show it to you. I mean, we can see it later on in the mathematics and see how it goes. Well, let's say for lambda equal to zero, how do you construct first the Hilbert space? So you will have, let's say, the symmetries are one part of the symmetries will be, as I said, the, the SO4, and then you have the SO6. This will be the global part. Okay. Now associated to these guys, you have the SU2 left and SU2 right. You, know? you can have rising operators, or, or we call it plus minus, and then also lowering operators associated to a left side of this guy. Then you can have rising operators to a right SU2 and lowering operators as well. And then you can have also, so, and these are spinners of S, spinners of SU2 left, spinners of SU2 right, spin up, spin down. And, uh, and then you can have also spinners of SO6, okay? Then you have fermionic rising operators, which I would call, well, let me call it eta to be consistent with some notation. Eta 1, eta 2, eta 3, eta 4, and also there. So you have rising and lowering operators, the dual to this one. So we have eight in total in, total in this case. And, uh, and then you can denote the vacuum, and you can act with the rising operators on top of these guys, and you can generate, these are bosons, these are fermions, so you can generate bosons and fermions and so on. There are some constraints, I will not review this in here because it's two of them, okay? But just to give an idea on how that this is not very abstract. And then you have also, this would generate states in the physical theory at specific uh, coordinate point. You need also derivatives acting on those fields to generate points at different values, so translated 
translate fields from one point to, to other. Okay? So in this way, so you can construct algorithmically the Hilbert space H for n equal to four uh, super young males. Okay? The supercharges are constructed by essentially taking one representative of this guy, so either A and one of these, one boson, one fermion, so the supercharges are fermionic by definition, or one of these guys and, this, and one of these guys. So there are 32 in, in total. Okay. And uh, so that, that's, this is the sketchy way of representing how the Hilbert space is constructed. Then you, you have to do, for, for each one of the bosons, so you will have many, let's say, single particle states, which would be a states generated by a single action of one of these rising operators on the, on the vacuum. And then you will have descendants of those, which you obtain by acting with the pimions on that, okay? And something that with care, it will be true that you can generate any state by taking those single particles powers of those, okay? And in the free theory, the charges of the higher powers will be a sum of the charges of the single particle states, okay? Not in the interacting theory, it's more complicated, okay? So using that axiomatically, then you can write down, for instance, for bosons, for a single boson state, remember, the observer was trace x delta j1, j2, r. So for a single boson and all the higher powers, you get something like, this would be a contribution to a partition function. So just a single oscillator, where delta zero, j one zero, j two zero, and r zero are the charges of that single yeah, particle state. Okay, and now for that state, I can always take this and put it into exponential as a minus log of that. Then I expand the log, the minus log, using this identity, just a Taylor expansion, and I'm zero. And you will get something like this, n delta zero. Sorry. The one zero. If I'm not missing any sign. Exactly, okay? So some n from one to infinity. And for fermions, because of Pauli exclusion principle, Yes, this is plus here. I think, right, because of Pauli's prison principle, we will get something similar. But now in the numerator, no? so you cannot have two, two spin, two fermions in the same representation. Okay. And so the difference is that you will get now exponential there will be an overall minus because Pauli exclusion principle. So this is in the denominator, this is in the numerator. And there will be also a, I'm oh sorry. Right, as we were using minus, I, I erased the original boundary conditions. You had anti-periodic boundary conditions. You will have something like this. And the same here. So n delta zero, p n j one zero, q n j two zero. Okay. So this minus is because of Pauli exclusion principle. This minus one to n is because of anti-periodic boundary conditions. Okay. And then you is for every so it's multiplicative as I said. No, you is for all the bosons. You is for all the fermions, and you can do it. It's algorithmical. For it. many people have done it in the path for n equal to force by mills, and you can write down, uh, you can write down an expression of the form. Essentially, you end up with something that looks 
you need to be careful. Well, this nobody has. They should have asked. Every letter is in the adjoint of UN. So I will also add some charge. So you take powers of these letters and you will get, so the letters are covariant, not invariant on the, the gauge transformations, okay? So the powers of it will not necessarily be invariant the, the gauge transformation. So the trick is you put some rapidity associated to the gauge charge and then you weight the charge of whatever is the guy that you are counting, okay? And, uh, and then you integrate over this use with the hard mature so this will be n times n matrices. Okay. And then you have the exponential. You have something like this. And I would call this gamma sp, single particle. Some dependence on n. And then there will be rapidity x to n. I will assume delta zeros to be one for some, in some unit, OK? And then we'll have P to N, we'll have Q to N, and U to N. And so this is minus this function here. What this function is for the full theory, okay, this by definition is what I define as minus F. It's a function of X, P, again, P, P sorry, P, Q, and U. Okay, that's the function that we need to study singularities of. Okay, and uh, but this is like, like I say, huge function. I will show you the mathematical file. It's something it's, it's, I cannot even write this in, in the for probably in the forum. It's very large. Okay, but it simplifies a lot when u is equal to minus one. It's but something to note is that gamma is it's a rational function. Okay, it can only have poles. As singularities. Gamma is not as a function of x to n. Then you have to sum over n. Okay? You get something more involved. So something to keep in mind is that this guy can only have pulse singularities. And those are the ones that we will probe. Now, now this, the integral over un essentially, uh, what it's doing is, is that it's projecting the counting. So it's essentially only counting states that, that have zero gauge charges, which are gauge invariant. So it's the, it's the Gauss constraint, the one that is impossible. Right, and I should have put this in here. Indeed, as we are working, n equal to four super jam means you work only with a joint. For other theories, it would be more complicated. You would have to, when you sum over all particles, what you get is a character of, of the adjoint of this un times un matrix. So concretely, the matrix U is, you can think of, so this trace is simply a sum, I from one to N, exponential of two pi I, a small UI, sorry, let me use a different letter here. Okay, where exponential two pi I, U J, I, are the eigenvalues of this matrix here, okay? And for the inverse, you just put a minus in here. No? That's the key. And this use, you can, the small use, they run in between zero and one. So nothing deeper than that, okay? Now to see the function, what the function looks like, let me take again the simplest case, u equal to minus one. And when u is equal to minus one, meaning when you go to to the index, this function looks like looks like follows. So this gamma sp at u equal to minus one is the following rational function. Is, uh, I will explain what is this. Uh, this is u tilde, 
I will find this is actually one by. Minus one. Okay. So it's, it's this simple rational function. Where you tilde is, is, I'm leaving it there for some reason, okay? But it's simply min minus one, okay? So this is one, a cubic root of one, okay? And this is the, the square of that cubic root of one, okay? So this is very simple. No, it's, it's not, uh, you cannot, and, and you see that it is, you have this polling here, no? All the singularity, well, all power-like singularities will come from this guy. Okay. Then you can have some logarithmic singularities, which I'm hiding, hiding here for some reason. Okay. But let me not talk about those now. Okay. And uh, so we have this. Uh, so you see, when p is equal, so what kind of singularities you can have in here? So when p goes to one plus omega one zero over lambda. And the same for Q. Then this blows up and it goes like lambda square. Okay. And then if you place, uh, right, if you use what we had before here, you see that this N here needs to be, uh, this is two in order to have competition, because you have the omega one will be like omega one zero over lambda. The J one goes like lambda to the N plus one. So the, this one get cancels by the one over lambda coming from the omega one. And then you need to have competition with this guy, which goes like lambda square. So that fixes this more N to two. Right. And at this point, you would say that's game over. There is no over singularity, but that's not true because you have some over. You have some over small ends in here. So this sum over small ends, essentially, it's, it's, it's not hard to see that if you square this or take cubics of this, then you start to see that you you can have more complicated singularities, which are localized at uh, roots of unity, in general. Okay. For all of them. The grow would be always lambda square, or the lambda square, but the overall coefficient would be different. Actually, it would depend on which root of unit you are considering. Okay, so the leading one is is this one. The leading coefficient comes from, from that. And let us see what what you, for instance, let let's see what is this coefficient, the other lambda square coefficient. So when I take lambda, so p and q do this at lean order. At lambda going to infinity. You see, just take the product of this, and use the fact that u tilde is equal to minus one, this is a cubic root of one, and what, but now you, you have sums, so I don't want this, but I want, I want that. So I want to study this, sum, n flows one to infinity, gamma, again, u equal to minus one, and um, it's a function of n, x to the n, p to the n, q to the n, and right. Well, in this case, u is minus one. I can simply assume here. So I want to study what happens to this when lambda goes to infinity. And then you see that the, at leading order, so you have this one over n in here. So we have something like this. You have one over n from this guy, but then from this guy and this guy, you get another factors of n, because you have p to the n now and q to the n. So it will, you will have something like n cube, omega one, omega two, okay? And in the numerator, you will get something like u to the minus, u tilde to the minus two third, minus u tilde to third uh, n, u tilde to third n. 
And then immediately you recognize this as a polylog, as a litri. No? So this is essentially litri, you twill uh, minus two third, minus litri, you twill uh, two third, divided, sorry, a factor of three that is in here, which I missed, perhaps, good. And, uh, and that divided, so three times that, this times three, and that divided omega one, omega two. So this is the leading behavior of this singularity, this boundary condition. The six, you mean the six? Right, this one, this. Right, right, right. Ah, do you mean this one? Why the cubic here? Ah, okay, that, that's true. That's related to R charges. That, that, to explain that, I would need to work with a more general observer than this one. Yes, it, it comes because of some part, it, it comes because of this factor. For SO6, I have three R charges. So I could have written down something like this. R1, R2, and R3. And then put rapidities for all of them. So for simplicity, I didn't want to write down that many of those. So you have something like this. And then you have three of those guys. As I take them to be the same, then I have that. If I do it for the refined case, then I would get, this would depend on some, this different utility. So still you will get something like litri, but it will be combinations of U1 and U2. And so that's the right. Very good. And this actually matches the supergravity. So in the, on the supergravity side, on the gravitational side, now we have refined the semi-classical limit. We have taken n to infinity, so n, n squared much larger than one, and then we, we have taken also this limit lambda to infinity, okay? Meaning by this large charge, the physics, the physics is this large charge expansion here, okay? There we pick up a single side point for single exponential growth, okay? Leading over everything else. And, and we have checked, I mean, in this series of papers since 2008, that this matches on the nose, the result coming from supergravity. Once you take black hole, Lorentzian black hole, we rotate at finite temperature, take the supersymmetric limit. On that, you get precisely the thing here. By the way, this combination here is a, is a periodic Bernoulli polynomial of the, so this you can evaluate in terms of pi. I don't remember the number, by, right? but this, uh, yes. So this negative combination here is, is uh, okay. Very good. So I, I can show you afterwards. So that, well, in terms of it. And then you could, but then you could ask, if you are really like very rigorous, you could say, okay, but you have a complete sum in here. You only took the leading one. So you only took the expansions omega one, omega two to zero. What about the extra terms in here? What do you get in there? Is, don't you have an infinite number of terms added up? No, this could be problematic. Right, that's actually a good point. But what happens is the following. When you do this more precisely at subleading order, you get contributions adding up to this, which will be subleading, which go like, this one goes like lambda square, the other ones will go like lambda minus p, p some positive numbers. But the ones coming from there will always be proportional to combinations of Lee Three minus p. Okay. So, well, okay. I, I, I was also hiding something in here, which I will not mention because it's a bit more involved. Notice that there were also rapidities for the gauge fields in here. There are n of them. Okay. So when I take this limit, I because because I was lazy. When I take this limit. What I really get, so I, I essentially assume that you did, I did not write it and it was a mistake. You get a factor of n squared in here, a large n, okay? But in order to justify this, what you need to do is the following. You take the, you take the lambda to infinity limit, lambda to infinity limit, and what you get is effective actions for, you get effective actions for these holonomies, for the gauge holonomies. Then you need to extremize that. You need to solve the side points for those guys. And you all need to evaluate the solution of those other points in here. But the leading side point actually is, is simply, 
is simply all the small u's equal to zero. Okay? And that means that when I take this trace in here, I will get from this guy a factor of n, from this guy a factor of n. And then I get n squared. This is coming from the least side point for the use. If one does this carefully, you really need to solve for the side points of this equation of sublinear order. Okay? So what I'm saying is in these expansions, you will get some litris that depends on the use, on the capital use. And then you need to extremize over those. Okay? Let me come back to this point here. Before extremizing any of those, and that's actually important, you have, and this is over, you have some dependence on the capital U, on combinations of litris, but combinations of this form at different perturbative ordering in land analytic ordering, analytically per and perturbatively, perturbatively, but analytically perturbatively in lambda, you will get combinations of this form. So minus This is the one the tooth star. Something like this. This is not precise, absolutely. Uh -huh. What I mean by this is that the use enters entering here, no? For essentially. Uh -huh. Let me see if this is right. So when p equal to zero, this is one. Right. So essentially, so what I'm saying is at every, so you, you expand this in powers of lambda. The lean contribution would be order lambda square, so we saw in here, but then you have next, sub, I mean, sublin, first sublin contribution, second sublin, and so on, and these are parameterized by this piece, okay? It is important to do it always with the use, the cache guys present in there, and then localize, so side point, uh, extremize with respect to them what you get. So. In physical terms, this is computing an effective action for the use, okay? What happens is that when P is larger or equal than four, all possible combinations that enter at this order, they can always be organized in this sort of combinations. But notice that these are negative lists. But this scene is, is such that uh, it vanishes identically because of some identities of negative polylogs. So what happens is that the perturbative expansion in lambda truncates at order A, at order one over lambda. Okay. And this is actually, I don't know if this is a, like a common thing, I don't know, but this, it happens always for the index. When we do it in this kind of computations, it happens always. Or now this is not right. This for the index it happens, it happens, but it happens also for the partition function. So if you relax this for the most, remember I was taking this particular example, but if you do it for the more general example, it happens as well. So it always truncates at some at some level. Good. So let me summarize what we have so far. You get the factor of n squared coming from the side point of the of the use. At least in order, you get this contribution in here. This matches the on-shell action of the supergravity theory, okay, on some black holes. And the series in lambda, in this, uh, again, this is the expansion. I'm substituting p, p as e to the omega one zero over lambda. And I'm taking the limit in here. I was taking the limit lambda to infinity at fixed omega one zero. Okay, but someone very acute could say, okay, no, no, but why if you make this guy also a function of lambda? Why cannot you make that thing, that thing function of lambda and take lambda to infinity? So that would be a different limit lambda to infinity, in which you will have supplying corrections, uh, which are non-trivial. You can generate, but let me say that one chooses just one frame. So this is the frame of computation that I chose. Okay. And at this, in this frame of computations, you always get, you always get this truncation at, at this order. Then the other ones you can get by the definitions of omega one zero. Because once I have the, these truncated expansions in some, as function of, I substitute omega one as by omega one zero over lambda, then I can simply redefine the omega and generate whatever that's a order, okay? The linear order expansion is the same, okay? 
But what this is telling you is, is that the form of the effective action that you get in these singular limits depends on how you reach the point. It's not independent on how do you do it. And actually, the same thing you see from the gravitational side. On the gravitational side, is, is you need to be careful how you reach the supersymmetric black hole, actually. If you reach it in different ways, you reach different shell actions, not just this one. This is for the, well, this is the leading contribution, okay? For the supersymmetric, there is no big problem. But when you step away from supersymmetry, it's, uh, which means you are not at the supersymmetric point, meaning it depends how do you reach it, that's what I'm saying. Okay? Now, you get this answer in here. So essentially what you get is, but well remember, the goal was to get this. So take the trace at fix J1 and J2. Okay, let, let me just cut this. The seed is truncate for some frame, for some specific families of limits. And so what this is saying is that in the leading, summarizing, for u equal to minus one, uh, in the limit lambda to infinity that I define it, okay, the free energy has this form. It's just a number that I will just put as a number. Omega one times omega two times n square. The number is important, but I, I don't remember how now. Yeah. Period. Right. Right, this is the periodic Bernoulli, the periodic Bernoulli polynomial. The periodic Bernoulli polynom polynomials. This is a third order periodic, well, it's not a, poly a polynomial, it's piecewise polynomial. Right, sorry, no, it's a cubic truncated and then periodically, right. 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 Right, so, the, the, but this is before, before going to fixed charges. Now this, the Laplace transform becomes a large charges becomes, it's a legend transform of this, okay? And if I do a legend transform of this, then what I get is this observer here, which is really the guy that I'm interested on. Okay, it's, it's what I want, so you will see why physically. And the answer that you get when you legend transform this, so let me say, this is legend transforming with respect to omega one and, and omega two, is, is this. So you get something that I would call S zero, you will see why pi i times r zero. So it's something that has a real and an imaginary part. A zero and r zero are, are uh, real, actually, and they have some interpretation, you will see. Where, where s zero is, uh, s zero is this, at lean order. It can be improved, actually. The paper is improved. It takes this form. And r zero is, uh, this is R0, and this is a, R0 is essentially a, so this is equal to 3P R0. Okay, so this is at least in order, remember J1 and J2, they grow like, they grow like lambda cube. This is again, always in the point U equal to minus one, okay? So the J1 and J2, they grow like N squared lambda cube, okay? This S zero, which is supposed to be entropy, this is supposed to be counting. Well, entropy is, there is a minus one to F insertion in there. I need to be careful with that. So if I take U equal to minus one, this reduces to traces, trace over the Hilbert space, minus one to the F, P to the J1, Q to the J2. So this is, ah, sorry, and, and if I fix J1 and J2, then I simply take the trace, J1, J2. So this is counting states at fixed level of charge J1 and J2 with minus one for, bos for fermions, minus A and one for bosons. So it's not really a full partition function, and there is interesting physics, but I will not enter into it. So naively, this is E to N entropy, you would say very naively, E to N entropy, but it's really, a complex thing. So you have, and actually you can have, you can have, actually you have two, com always two sides that make, there is some interference effect that needs to be understood in there. I will not comment much about that. Okay. But essentially what you get is this. So you say, this is the exponential 
of this S0 plus pi i r0, and S0 is precisely the area of the horizon of these dual black holes divided by four at leading order in the large charge expansions. At subleading order in lambda, then this expression needs to be modified. This is there in the paper, but I will not enter into it. That's the leading order expansion. So this is generalization of Cardi gross. Cardi would be square root. This is two third. Okay. Good. Now to make I don't know how much how much time do I have? Huh? Five, ten? Okay, let me end. Okay, good, good. So so to make it more concrete to uh, our friends, mathematicians, I will, just for u equal to minus one, let me write down. Because at this point, this, is, this expression is good actually to do a side point approximation, but the counting is not very, well, it's clear at the level of single particle states, but not at the full level. No? You can write down this actually, this in a different way for u equal to minus one. Let me write it there. Again, U is this same thing that I described. U is for all the bosonic, all the boson letters, all the fermion letters, you sum over all of them. And for U equal to minus one, not for U, for U different from minus one, I have not, well, the expression is there, it can be found, but there is nothing as simple as this. And this perhaps will make, give me time to link with integrability a bit. So again, u equal to minus one. Again, u equal to minus one. This trace Is as I said, just an integral over. This is the the hard measure. UN matrices. Sorry, no. Let me not write it in. Let me write it in terms of the small eigenvalues, just to make it even simple. So integrals in between zero and one, and then there there are n integration variables, and then you have what is called elliptic gamma function. Okay. With second arguments, these are generalizations of the of the Jacobi theta functions, okay. where you have, a, okay. in this case, u i j p k. I will define what is u i j p q. And then, in, assuming that I turn on three chemical potentials for these guys, different, you get something like, in the most general case. Again, the elliptic gamma function, uij, and then, uh, right, let me say u, capital J here. With some constraint among these guys. We pull this. Three times q. Where these functions come here, the so called elliptic gamma function. So uij, and there is a product also over ij in here. Sorry. So it's products over I, I different from J from one to N in here. UIJ is essentially a, a diagonal a UN matrix with I can value, sorry, sorry, the diagonal element of the unitary, unitary mat, the IF diagonal element of the unitary matrix U and the UJ is the JF element. So products over I different from J from one to N. And then there is also 
a, a factor in here, which I will not, which is also a function of P and Q, but I will not write down. But this is this is a Q series, no? It's a generalization of the Q series. Where this gamma elliptic guy is simply defined as this. It's, it's a quotient of Pockhammer symbols, but let's say it's Right, is this is this in in there? Ah, perfect. In this use, right? Good, very good. This is what I. So this guy is the same as is this. 2 pi i, qi, minus uj. Right, perfect, that's good, uh, that's actually essential. And so essentially, yes, you have to expand these guys, and that's uh, this is a good series, you just expand in a small piece and q's, and you get integers for all these guys. But this is only valid when u, I, mean, I have, when the u, okay, let me denote his like this, when all the, no, no, in this case, right, this is only valid for some combination that, ah, right, this is only valid when you have right. Well, I, I put already minus one to f, because it's okay. So these are equivalent ways of writing down the same guy. Now it would be interesting, and actually this representation helps to make link with the integrabilities. You can actually see this integral, you can actually write down as a sum over, over certain eigenvalues uh, configurations, classical eigenvalues configurations, which are solutions of elliptic beta answer sequentials. I will, I can show you in a few minutes there. In which the S matrix looks like a quotient of Jacobi theta functions. And that's, uh, no, it's a bit, uh, Intriguing because it's not understood what is the, or at least I don't understand what is the integral model. It's, it's a sort of lattice model, but in which you have continuum spin or something like that. The UIJs would be like the spin of these guys. Okay. In this case, yeah, right. In this, well, in this case, it's right. At, at this level, this is the supersymmetric sector. Right, right, right. It's, uh, right even at a strong coupling in, in this subsector of the theory, that would be true. Right, good. Now the question is, once you relax this condition, when you step away from that, what happens to everything that I said in here? Okay, I only have one minute, or two minutes. So what happens? That's, and that's what I wanted to reach, but I, it's too much, but it's okay. Good, so we step away from supersymmetry. What can we get? Now we need to do the same with the generalization of this guy. So relax this condition in here, expand around this, you need also to be a bit careful because now the other chemical potentials in order, and the claim is the following. If you now refine the expansion, so assume now that beta zero is, so scale lambda in this way, it keep, no, that goes inverse with, beta, and beta zero can be whatever, okay? And uh, and then alpha, alpha remember is a small, u is e to the two pi i alpha, so alpha, equal to one half would be the condition u equal, so the condition to index, to reach the index, and then expand in this way, alpha, okay? And now re repeat everything that I, that I said for the supersymmetric case, but now with these scalings, okay? For each one of the saddles in the supersymmetric sector, you, you will have also a saddle away from the supersymmetric sector in this case, okay? And you can compute corrections to the free energy, corrections to this guy, in that expansion. That would be still a large charge expansion, but now you will have also some scaling properties for the other charges in game. So delta in particular will go like, again, n squared, some power of n that you need to determine by this balancing condition that I mentioned, by this balancing condition between these two guys, okay? And the same for, for the r in here. So n squared with some other power. So n delta and r. 
Uh, but now you can only rely on the free theory, okay? On the free theory, on the free theory, uh, what we get is the following. Now you get, a focus on this, obser on this observable, okay? The logarithm of that. So you need to compute corrections to the free energy at small, so in this lambda exp large lambda expansion. The answer that we get, and just to be very quick, is the following. So let's say the prediction is trace x delta a okay is that it goes like at fix j1 and j2 is that goes like e2 at least a leading order in this new large lambda expansion is something like this so you have e2 a, a zero which is the same as zero that I, that I made this is zero in there but now you have plus pi plus two pi alpha r zero the same r zero that we had before so the computation that I described before is with alpha equal to one half, okay? So it matches that thing. But now there is a new contribution here, proportional to alpha minus one half. So if you are at the supersymmetric point, this thing will cancel out. And then you, need, you get the next two leading guy, which goes like this. Uh, I think I, I'm not, hopefully I'm not missing some factor. I can write down it this way. It's inversely proportional. So it's proportional to the temperature. That's the first contribution in a large, Lambda to infinity, but now I'm, for some reason, I want to focus on beta zero, beta zero to infinity after taking lambda to infinity, okay? Then I get this, and I rewrite everything in terms of the original variables. That and multiplies alpha minus one half. And then you can actually compute the full tower here. There are all, all corrections, but this is IN in the free theory, always. Not strong coupling, just free theory. So there is no reason for this to match supergravity at all. So this, and I get corrections in this. Now the new, this is, in, this is temperature. Now the new guy is this one. And for that, the expression that we get is, let me see what is the thing. Okay, let me write it this way. So M, so one over M is uh, a leading order in the large charge expansion. It goes again like, like S zero, but now we, we divide by 12 square root three of pi, okay? All these expre expressions can be improved and they are improved in the paper as subleading order in analytic expressions in the charges, okay? There could be non-analytic contributions like the ones you were mentioning in this morning coming from log I have omitted many things in here, no? There could be like log contributions which are subleading with respect to a power like ones, and they can give like uh, jumps, contributions which would be subleading, but they can be, there. they will be there at some point. And all this has interest in physics that needs to be uncovered. This is yet like ground, it's ground that has not been explored so far, okay? Anyway, at, at, at the analytic level, we're forgetting our log corrections and so on, and non-perturbatively suppressed ones, you can actually uh, completely com com uh, compute the complete expansion in there, okay? This will not be these nice functions here, but more, more complicated, okay? And now, with the, again, this computation is done in the free theory, and this is for a specific limit, lambda to infinity. As I mentioned, I, can, I have infinitely many ways of defining my lambda to infinity limit, okay? But if I want to compare with gravity, I need to define, once I define chemical potentials in gravity, so I take the geometry, I look at the asymptotic form of the geometry, and I identify that with the geometry of, in which I place n equal to force by Jan Mills to compute that, then it's, there is nothing to it. The limit in gravity has to be the same as the limit in, in field theory. So that's, that's the limit that I choose in here, okay? And then you can say, once you have done that, then you are free to compare. So what is your answer for this first correction? Compare this and the supergravity correction. What do you get? You do not expect to be the same, but it's the same actually. Even though the supergravity cor uh, computation is expected to be at strong coupling, okay? 
So I do not understand what we do not understand why this is the true, why is it's the same result. But it does it's just a number. Okay. And the, it has to be the same as lambda equal to infinity and lambda equal. But there is no supersymmetry preserving this thing. This contribution is not at the supersymmetric point. Okay. More generally, you can even all these high error corrections, because of supersymmetry and analyticity, you can actually see that whatever you just take the given soaking on shell action which is it's always a rational function, well, it's almost piecewise rational. You can always take an expansion, a, a complete expansion around zero temperature and supersymmetry of the on-shell action of some finite temperature black hole. That will give you some corrections at higher order in here. All of those, because the supersymmetric answer, which is the same always, no, is the leading one, are bound to be encoded, you can always write down as the result of the free field theory computation by renormalizing the, the chemical potentials, simply, by things that depend on lambda. This is very obscure, I don't know why this is true, but it's coming from supergravity comparing with field theory. So there is something like an RG flow coming here, perhaps the large charge expansion simplifies the computation in, in field theory. I don't know what is the answer to that. Okay, it's uh, curious. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Coming back to the physics, so there, there are, again, as I said very quickly, the idea is you, you take the, the expansion near the singularities of these guys, and then you write down an effective action for the, for the gauge holonomies. The effective action, given the leading power-like behavior in lambda, which truncates for the lambda to infinity expansion that I took, you can focus only on analytic contributions, let's say. No? But there will be a sublime order non-analytic contribution, since it look like log U, I, J's, and so on, okay? At order zero in lambda, or lambda to the zero order. This thing, for what I told today, which is, is at the level of semi-classical gravity, it's just given Hawking, I'm comparing with given Hawking, effective action, expanding at zero temperature. That's not necessary. But if you really want to understand all this, eh, I mean, claims, there are some claims in the literature that there is chaos emerging when you go to zero temperature and to supersymmetric solutions, no? Those may be related to some sort of random matrix. The effective action for the U, perhaps you can write down in terms of a random matrix theory. So you can derive the effective action become essentially, so in the limit close to some singularity, you get something that is just a matrix, random matrix integral, essentially. No? But in order to have a grasp on that, you really need to have control over these guys, no? This would be like Van der Monde-like contributions. Then you can ask, but you already had some Van der Monde-like contributions. That was killed down by this one in here. This one in here killed, killed the Van der Monde in here, okay? In such a way that you reach, yeah, you reach this guy in here. In here, there is no band and bond. This is just interval between zero and one, and just the elliptic gamma functions in here. But there is no band and bond part. Okay, so you need to recover something from the from this expansion here that to come. And there are there are perhaps ways that that needs to be explored. I will close. I think I am completely over. So I apologize. Thanks. <laughs> It happens as well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just didn't, do it, but it happens as well. It truncates at that, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This. Right. 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 I ah, yeah, that's right about right, but, right, but that's I know, but right. Right. Right, right, right. Right, right, right. Yes, yes, I put it there. 
with that, that's exactly, 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 exactly. exactly. Yes. I see, I see. Well, it comes, in this case, it comes because of. Uh, Right, it comes because it's a real, it's a real, it's a real representation. No? Because for each, at some point, I put the u to a row. I don't know if I. Uh, right, this comes from uh, it is this. So this, remember, I, I need. So I, I do a computation for single particles. Remember what I wrote in here. So you have for the bosons, and then you assume that the bosons to carry some charge on their on their the gauge group, and then you uh, you have a rapidity for the gauge group, which is u. And you take a power of that that is proportional to a charge of that bosonic layer. It's reality. It's, no, no, it's, it's reality of the gauge group, actually. It's the representation of the gauge. Right. Reality, exactly. It's reality of the representation of the gauge group. So as, as for every charge row, I will always have minus, minus row. And then there are other, uh, there are other things about the flavor symmetry, uh, representations that probably also conspire to that. Okay, but it's more reality of charges, I would say, what conspired to be that, is what I say. So it's silly, right, 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 I agree. I mean, you could have, if you give something different in here, it will, it will not be a multiple of pi square or something like that, no? it's more complicated. It could be a rash, no? non rational, no? multiple, so I don't know, something strange. But in this case, it's that, right? it's not uh, more complicated than that. Right. Again, this is, I focus on n equal to force by Jan Mills, but then you can do this. For other theories, you will change the um, elliptic gamma function content in here. No? So you have more, if you have more uh, matter, then you have to add elliptic gamma functions so you can make it more complicated. But, right. Yes. Yes, this. Uh, As it is OTOC. Right. Right, right, right. Oh, right, right, right. I see. I see. No, I, I would say, I would say, for instance, one thing could be this spectral form factor. I'll try to compute that. But now using this, this sort of approximation. First one needs to write down. There are There is literature on this already since last year. Well, you have. You have worked on this and some topic, but in N equal to force by Jan Mills, there is a paper actually from last year. Somebody tried this for the free theory, actually, for the spectral form factor. So I guess the, there should be, but not analytically. So it was like doing, but there has to be a way of doing it, I must say. No? Just taking these limits close to singularities, there should be some analytic way of doing that. But if you, if you see, a, if you already detect a random matrix theory in this limit, that's a, no, but that, for that you need this, this kind of terms. Otherwise it's too simple, the effective action. So the logarithmic terms are essential actually for that. And this I have not yet. Uh, so if you see that, there, then you see that's already, because if you had some random matrix theory in there, that there would be some chaos. It's not, depends on the power, no? One needs to see what are the details, so what, what do you get, I don't know. But I, I have not, this is completely, this discussion, but I have not worked yet. There are, these are claims that, that, are, that I think are very interesting and need to, need to be checked. Right. Ah, this is, by the way, just something I forgot. This is the mass, this is what is called the mass gap of the Schwarzian thing, no? So it says, so it gives the same answer, actually, from the free theory. Right, the delta associated to BPS states and then the other guys, right? Eh? It is, yes, 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 it is that precisely. Right, no, no, it's because of the way you construct the Hilbert space, no? So you, you start from covariant letters, then you take powers of that, but you really don't want to count things which are not invariant, gauge invariant, no? Then you need to project down to zero everything. And that essentially is, is you need to integrate over, no? just take averages of that, so it's because of that. But you can also see that I, I took the Hamiltonian appro approximation viewpoint, 
But you can do it also from path integral. And you can think of this as localization. Now it's the mole space of uh, mole space of flat connections. And uh, that's another way of seeing it. Exactly, exactly. So yes. Around this exactly. The non contractile, right. This one. Non contractile at, at the boundary. If you go to the interior, then this is something else. Right, and that's why it's important. So, if, right, and I stress this in the beginning. If you do what uh, you did yesterday, good. It's a different boundary. So you place the theory on S4. The localization is completely different. No? It's a different function then. So you will not get this, this thing. You get what you wrote down yesterday. So you get the, the Gaussian part, and then you get the instanton part, and so on, which is a different observable. So there are many other observables that you can construct. This is the one that we think, what we think, no, it's, there is evidence that this, Links with this given soaking yeah, on shell action. Okay, that's why I was telling this. Right. right, the link of, of, to integrability is also interesting because perhaps there is a way, this is related to a question that you asked, no? Perhaps, again, this is for the supersymmetric point that uh, I will not enter into this, but we can, during the week, we can talk about it during a coffee break or something like that. You can write down this as a sum over solutions or some better answers equation, which are elliptic equations. But it's unclear it's, it's if you can write down that away from, from the point u equal to minus one, no? So this, this is for this specific, uh, this is because of quasi-periodicity. These guys are quasi-periodic uh, functions, no? Um, so if you shift the capital U, you multiply multiplying by Q, so you substitute this. Then this picks up picks up a, a prefactor, which is a, a Jacobi theta function, theta zero, or something proportional to a Jacobi theta function. Because of that property, uh, you can write down, I mean, you can write down this sort of localization yeah. formula of this matrix integra, okay? But obviously, integrability is there, because, uh, I mean, this, this beta answers condition is not, uh, uh, there is there has to be some way of justifying this um, perhaps uh, but well, that's uh, that's hard I have not done this perhaps at u different from minus one you can also do something similar the expressions are, are much larger but right. 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 Very good. Very good. Yes. 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 Uh, well, you can have sort of operators. This would be, for instance, like brains, no, in the in the string theory picture. And actually, you can, in the supersymmetric setup, you can actually, yes, you can do the same. You can apply the same the same technique you apply there. I mean, that that would amount to correcting the inter and inter. You insert new functions into that. But the logic is always the same. So now the effective action will change, but you, you always need to localize nearby singularities. That's, that's all. Okay? And that gives you a thing that you match with supergravity, with probe limits in supergravity. And then you can compute corrections or all of that. Hopefully, it will be something like resurgence that allows you to compute the full thing at some point. But that's, again, this is still in infancy because it's, uh, the functions are not. Uh, I don't think, well, these elliptic systems, I don't, uh, there is no much literature about this. There are some papers on this better answer, it's elliptic system, continuous spin, but this, there is no much on that yet. Yeah. And this is, this should be related also with this quantum modularity thing that we were, you know, they all, always, again, P and Q has a different interpretation in here, but the fact that the, lim the limits to roots of unity in here, are always singular, and you get this sort of Casimir prefactors that are leading up the expansion. It sounds reminiscent of, of what they find as well, Low, in the lower dimensional context. No? Right, there is a lot, and that's another application in three, well, another application, but when you have surface defects, like you were asking, Louis, you can again redo the same thing. I have not, well, we have done with some collaborators for some specific setups in there. We are working on that a little bit, but uh, right. That the problem is, is the dual thing. How do you check this in supergravity? Because in principle, you insert the surface operator. You deform this. You solve this systematically. But then you need to compare with gravity or with strings on the other side. No? And this is, in principle, completely reacted. So 
perhaps there is a way of doing it in, in the string theory side. That would be a good, very important question to answer. But, uh, Thank you very much. Thanks.